as you can see, tonight's program, we have Dr. Natalie Braz. We are sponsored by Genentech and Santa Fe. And the purpose of this program is neuro, neurologic cognitive testing. Thank you, everybody. Dr. Braz, let's get started. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stu. Thank you all for having me uh, this evening. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all tonight. So um, I look forward to discussing the purpose and goals and benefits from neurocognitive testing and beyond. So um, right now we're going to start with my objectives. And again, I apologize for not being able to for you guys to see me. Um, unfortunately, we're having technical issues. Um, so in my program for uh, this evening, I would like to discuss uh, definitely the need for neurological consultation, the primary reasons to undergo testing in the first place, the warning signs to watch for when you're having cognitive deficits, what is the main role of neuropsychological testing, um, why having it in the first place, we will discuss also normal aging versus neurodegenerative conditions, um, also known as dementia, the role of emotions, behavioral and mood changes, and also treatment recommendations for patients as well as family members. Next slide. So let's start talking about the warning signs. So uh, obviously number one would be memory loss, especially for recent uh, information or recent memory challenges in planning and problem solving. Number three would be difficulty completing familiar tasks, things that we do on a daily basis that was easy for us to do and now uh, we're having difficulties completing those usual tasks. Confusion with time or place, so disorientation. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationships, especially when driving, navigating around, not being able to really know where you're at at a particular time point. New problems with words in speaking or writing. Misplacing things often, like your car keys, your cell phone, your glasses, things like that. Decreased um, or poor judgment in general withdrawal from work or social activities, so apathy, and overall changes in mood and personality. So what is the difference between normal aging versus dementia or neurocognitive disorders? So in normal aging, it's okay to have some difficulty remembering details of conversations or past events. However, not being able to recall the details um, or recent conversations or events in general. So not even details of it, but not being able at all to recall, not just having a difficulty, but not recalling at all that you had that conversation. Um, occasionally forgetting names, it's okay in normal aging. Um, there is after all a normal process of aging, but not recognizing the names of family members more often, and that's the dementia process. So in normal aging, we see forgetfulness for things and events, um, but then in dementia, we see it more frequently and regularly. In normal aging, we see occasional difficulty finding words, um, and then in dementia, we see just pauses and substitutions for those words. And then in normal aging, we ourselves get worried about our memory, but others do not. Now, in dementia, your other people, your relatives, your uh, family members, your friends will actually be worried about your memory and notice it, but you do not. And that's from the poor insight that it's a hallmark feature as well of the, of the dementia. So the primary reasons to actually undergo uh, neuropsychological testing and just in general seek help um, would be obviously if you have a neurological condition, um, if you have any chronic medical conditions, hypertension, diabetes, um, anything that it's called chronic medical condition that affects all of your systems, um, we definitely recommend for you to undergo neurological and neurocognitive assessment. Any insult to the brain, such as stroke, macrovascular ischemic changes, head injuries, any changes to the brain, really changes in cognitive performance that you are noticing or other people are noticing, 
Um, if there is suspicion of an underlying neurodegenerative process, like I said before, any type of suspicion. Um, effects of certain medications also on memory. Um, we do know that certain medications will definitely affect your cognition. So it's good to know if those medications are having an effect. And then also psychological disturbance. As we know, certain psychological factors will definitely worsen the way that we think and will affect other cognitive abilities as well. So first of all, the neurological consultation is very important. Um, you will be seen by a neurologist who will examine all of your cranial nerves, will go through everything thoroughly, including cognition. They may even administer a mini mental status exam or a screening to know where you're at in terms of cognition, especially if you come in with a primary complaint of memory loss. Then their neurologist will actually order and complete a neurological workup. They will provide adequate treatment based on the degree and of impairment, including the causes, possible causes of these conditions might be um, hypoxic brain injuries, might be sleep apnea if you're not getting enough oxygen during your sleep. So there is a lot of reversible causes as well. Um, metabolic type of conditions, infections, other comorbidities as well. So part of the neurological workup will include uh, blood work and a very extensive blood work that will look into all aspects that may interfere with cognition, especially B12, B6, thiamine deficiencies, any hormonal imbalances. Um, we will also order an MRI of the brain, particularly using neuroquant analysis which takes um, really an analysis and a deep look at the actual structures of, of the brain from a volumetric point of view and give us a nice report with percentages of those structures and what is deficient. Um, they can also order also other types of tests such as uh, SPECT, uh, uh, PET scans, uh, if you want to really know if you have any traces of Alzheimer's, uh, amyloid, uh, pathologies and all that genetic testing if you're predisposed and have a family history and lastly uh, neuropsychological testing. With neuroimaging like I mentioned before we look at the structural kind of um, changes of the brain. Um, for example in Alzheimer's we see generalized and focal atrophy within different structures of the brain. We see why matter lesions in other um, conditions. We see reduced hippocampal volume and also me mediotemporal kind of lobe atrophy as well, where the memory is really housed the most. And then with other type of neuroimaging and tests that can order, we can actually see a specific tracers like amyloid tracers in PET and CSF analysis if we're looking at any infectious disease kind of conditions, protein depositions. Um, so those are all very important aspects of your um, workup. Next slide. So with neuropsychological testing, what is it? Um, we hear of neuropsychological testing, not a lot of people know what it is uh, too much. So it is actually the objective uh, way of assessing uh, neurocognitive functions using a battery of standardized tests sensitive to brain dysfunction. So it reveals, like it says here, what your brain is able to do and not do from a functional standpoint, not from a volumetric um, imaging standpoint, but it's from a functional uh, standpoint. And then we compare your deficits to what we see, next slide, to what we see on actual neuroimaging, for example, on this, um, anatomy and functional areas of the brain. We type, try to actually localize based on your performance and uh, dysfunctions from neuropsychological testing. What are the areas consistent with those dysfunctions from an anatomical kind of uh, perspective? And if that is consistent with what we're seeing also on neuroimaging. So the idea is to look at everything as a whole in trying to localize uh, your deficits to yield at a diagnosis or multiple diagnoses. So with neuropsychological testing, we establish a baseline if there is no prior uh, testing from before in order for us to follow uh, you over time. 
so that we can compare your performance. We can differentiate among different forms of neurodegenerative conditions um, and other ideologies by looking at the uh, activity in your profile. We can classify the degree and severity of your cognitive deficits to potentially assess competency and capacity as well. Um, so if someone is able to make decisions or not, if someone else has to take over family matters or make important decisions for the patient because we do see that cognitive deficiency or the family members are seeing a clinical picture that warrants professional attention. So um, this is a very important aspect when it comes to legality of, of cases. Next slide. Um, then the results from the testing will help in neurological treatment planning. So choosing what medications, what memory agents, will actually be adequate for you in your case, depending on your cognitive profile and also your presenting conditions as well. And um, it will provide recommendations specific to your own cognitive deficit. Next. So uh, in assessing underlying neurocognitive conditions, so what we know is that obviously some neurological conditions, call it MS or chronic migraines, uh, post-stroke, uh, epilepsy, we know that those conditions, uh, there are cognitive deficits associated with those conditions in general. However, if there is an underlying neurodegenerative condition, meaning that you're predisposed and you're already presented with an underlying neurodegenerative process, then you may show greater deficits in certain areas than most people, even with the condition that you present with. And it has nothing to do with your neurological condition per se, but it's more, it has to do more with something neurodegeneratively that you had there, that it progressively it progressed to that point very slowly and gradually. So it had nothing to do with that neurological condition itself, but it will, your deficits will definitely uh, be more pronounced and will progress more rapidly if you do have a predisposition to a neurodegenerative condition. So like heart disease, for example, there's an overall term for dementia. Um, so it covers you know, a wide range of dementias, not just Alzheimer's, vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies. So there is a, a very ample array of conditions that come with neurodegenerative conditions in general. Alzheimer's is just one type of them. So what is dementia? So according to the DSM-5-TR, which is our latest manual, uh, dementia is a significant and acquired cognitive impairment in one or more cognitive domains, such as learning and memory, language, executive functions, complex attention, perceptual motor function, social cognition, that interfere right, with independence of daily living. So there is a significant decline, you know, from how you were functioning before. Let's say you used to function at a high average range, you know, and now you're functioning at a low average range where there is a significant decline. So we call that a deficit in general. So in order to be diagnosed with any type of dementia, you would have to have one or more cognitive domains being affected on our cognitive domains profile. What are possible causes of this type of conditions? Well, like we mentioned before, any abnormal brain change um, can cause it. Uh, chronic medical conditions over time can cause also um, cerebrovascular accidents, CVA, so infections, head injuries. So in terms of dementias, Alzheimer's is actually the most frequent one, the one what we, that we see uh, the most followed by vascular dementia. Then we see frontotemporal dementia, Lewy bodies, and then others, meaning Parkinson's, Huntington's, like I said before, there is um, a lot of many other dementias. Next. So in, in Discussing the specific types, I, I actually put on top Alzheimer's being the most frequent one that we know about. Um, and then in terms of what symptoms, you know, start first, then based on mental status, how the patient presents neurologically, neuropsychiatrically, what kind of symptoms we see in general from a neurological standpoint and what the imaging 
would actually be consistent with. So in Alzheimer's disease, we see the first symptom as memory loss. Then mental status, we see episodic uh, memory loss being affected the most. So this means like trouble remembering or learning a list of words and then being able to recall immediately or after a delay that list of words. Also trying to memorize stories and not being able to recall even a short story after 20 minutes or 30 minutes. That will be episodic memory loss. And uh, really nothing else that will call our attention would be affected other than that poor insight with Alzheimer's. Neuropsychiatrically, they seem okay. They really don't have much symptoms of depression or anxiety, and it comes with that, you know, apathetic type of presentation and poor insight. Neurologically, they look okay initially. And then on imaging, we are able to see some atrophy on MRIs. Then frontotemporal dementia, which is the second one down this table, the first symptom usually um, that is affected is mood with apathy being the hallmark feature. So not being, not caring much for other people, for what happens to them. Um, they're kind of oblivious. They have poor insight. Uh, a speech at times, you know, is affected. And there's different types of also of frontal temporal dementia when language is affected. Um, with mental status, when we use a mini mental status exam or a screening, we see frontal and executive deficits, and obviously at times language if the patient presents with a logopenic type of uh, frontotemporal dementia. Neuropsychiatrically, there is sometimes some sort of disinhibition with the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, um, where now, you know, their personality may have changed. Family members report that they're a little bit more disorganized, maybe disrespectful to other people, um, maybe more disinhibited, kind of like that. And then um, in imaging, we definitely see frontal uh, or temporal atrophy at times, not all the time. And then um, with Lewy body dementia, the first symptoms is usually involves visual hallucinations, problems with like sleep. Um, we see Parkinsonism uh, as one of the hallmark features as well, and it's accompanied by depression also, um, delusions, and then we see obvious drawing and frontal executive type of deficits on uh, mental status. Um, on imaging, we see posterior and parietal atrophy. Hippocampi is usually larger than in Alzheimer's. Then um, in Creutzfeldt jacob disease, uh, we definitely see a more advanced dementia. You know, um, mood is affected, there's anxiety, movement disorders as well. More than Parkinsonism, we see a lot of rigidity and myoclonus. We also see depression and anxiety on those type of patients. And then on imaging, even the thalamus, basal ganglia might be impaired as well. And then with a vascular type of dementia, um, the profile tends to be variable, so patient presents with symptoms that are not very clear cut, um, but usually um, they're very patchy. Uh, they can perform well at any given time during the day and seem very good and, and with a, an intact mental status, but it can change from time to time, even during the day. Like I said, it's variable. When uh, when you test them, we see frontal and executive um, deficits, a lot of a slowing in processing the information, uh, more than memory loss in general. We see apathy as well, delusions, anxiety. And then on imaging, we see cortical and even subcortical um, infarcts, you know, basically based on vascular ideology. Um, and then that could be consistent with like white matter type of conditions. So what are the risk factors? So the greatest known risk factor is obviously increasing age, okay? As we age, you know, uh, our brain starts to deteriorate as well, just like our hair does, our skin does, everything, our vision. So the same thing happens with the brain. So usually Alzheimer, um, the risk factor for Alzheimer's is being older than 65. And then we call of younger onset if the if the patients present uh, with less than or or younger than 65, which does happen. And I I usually I see it here 
in our clinic, you know, patients presenting in their 40s, believe it or not, or 50s as well, um, with significant deficits and even atrophy on the MRIs, which is sad. Um, so that's what we call early onset Alzheimer's, when it presents younger than 65. So um, people can live a long life, but usually on the, for the most part is four to eight years after diagnosis, but they can live as long as 20 years, depending on other factors as well. Um, Alzheimer's is a progressive condition. It really doesn't get better. There is medication to slow it down, to slow down the progression of the memory loss. And this is very, very important, especially um, earlier in the process when you don't have significant deficits or significant enough deficits um, so that we can have an impact. Uh, research, research shows that if you tackle it, you know, when you have a mild um, cognitive impairment presentation, the medication works better than if you come in later when it's too advanced, then the medication doesn't have the same effect. Um, treatment, like I mentioned before, you know, it kind of slows down the symptoms, it improves quality of life, and um, today there is a worldwide effort underway to find better ways to treat the dementias. Um, the delays, the delays onset and prevent them from developing. Uh, what we know is that, you know, treating the symptoms around it is the way to go right now. And obviously um, being proactive about what to do to prevent it from happening. So what to do, my recommendation is really to assess the situation, see what's going on around you. If you have the stressors that might be triggering your situation, um, what else is going on in your life? Um, has anyone else noticed the change that you're experiencing? Have a conversation with family members, you know, open conversation as to, you know, what they see, what they are noticing in you being open, you know, to receive that kind of feedback without being defensive about it. Um, go to your doctor, to your specialist, you know, go first to your PCP, ask for a referral to a neurologist. Um, when you show up to a neurologist with uh, memory concerns, a neurologist will definitely uh, refer you to a neuropsychologist so that they, we can complete, you know, part of the workup that they order. Like I said before, with the blood tests, you know, then the neuroimaging, and then lastly, the neuropsychological evaluation. So reach out for help. Reach out for help. Uh, you're not alone, and there's a lot of people experiencing um, this kind of changes with cognition, especially as we age. They're kind of expected. Um, but knowing what's normal and what's not, it's the key, and it does make a difference in receiving treatment. Um, if you do not need treatment, you know, uh, basically, you know, we would just say that it's, it's part of a normal process of aging and we can continue to monitor you. Um, you come in for retesting in some time from the time you were initially tested and at least you have a baseline so that when you undergo future testing, we can compare your performance to your, your prior performance. And that's very telling because it speaks about your clinical progression as well. So what other factors impact cognition? And I think we also went over this uh, in the beginning of my presentation. Next slide. So like we mentioned before, emotional well-being is key, right, in, in seeking help for cognition. So psychological symptoms, depression and anxiety will definitely um, have a major impact on the way we think, um, how we make decisions, uh, how well we focus or not um, on information. So if we're having symptoms of anxiety, restlessness, and we're extremely anxious, and we worry a lot, and uh, we can't sleep, is the, our sleep also gets disturbed, you can already imagine what an impact that will have in your thinking the skills with intrusive thoughts, you know, um, interfering with new learning. If you're trying to learn the name of a person, trying to uh, recall a conversation you had yesterday, and you can't, and if you're having elevated symptoms of depression and anxiety, if you're feeling hopeless and helpless and have all these negative symptoms within you, 
And on top of that, you also have anxiety. I, I say on top of that because anxiety and depression work very well together. It's rare where I see a depression without symptoms of anxiety. They go hand in hand. So if you're restless and you're extremely worried and apprehensive and you even have symptoms of panic attacks and things like that, of course, your ability to focus is going to be impacted. If you can focus well on the information that, that is presented to you and that you're trying to learn and encode in the first place, it's what we call an executive dysfunction. So it's an inability to attend to multiple stimuli at the same time in order for you to encode that information effectively. So it's really not a memory deficiency, but it's more of an executive dysfunction in your inability to organize that information in the first place. And that can be easily treated with some recommendations to address those cognitive deficiencies um, with compensatory strategies, for example. So psychological stressors, anything that you may undergo in your life that you have going on at the present time, a lo loss of a family member, um, any changes, any, a, you know, distress at work, anything that may be altering your normal self, you know, it's considered a stressor and it will definitely exacerbate your emotions as well as your cognition. So like I said, it, you know, um, mind, so the brain, the behavioral and the emotional aspects go together. So when one is out of balance, the rest will also be. Sleep hygiene is very, very important. That's the time that the brain gets to rest and reset itself. We need enough oxygen to go into that brain. Uh, and if we don't have a good uh, sleep hygiene, we won't be able to acquire that. Any pain syndrome, so being and living with pain is detrimental to our health in general, especially our emotional health. And that leads to, again, symptoms of depression, that leads to anxiety, and it's a cycle that never ends, and that's going to cause, as well, problems focusing, and again, problems with memory. So it might not be a true organic memory deficit, but it might be provoked by this type of changes. So when you go through psychological testing, we also have some measures that assess the symptoms of depression and anxiety within a cohort of patients with pain. So we compare your symptoms, how you feel, you know, within your pain to a population of patients that are also pain patients with those types of symptoms, okay? And then fatigue is a big one. So fatigue is a very common symptom of a lot of conditions. And uh, fatigue also affects uh, our thinking ability, obviously. So it's important to address fatigue as well. Next. So the behavioral and psychological aspects, um, usually uh, with dementia or an advanced type of presentation in a neurodegenerative condition, uh, presents itself in middle, middle and late course of the condition. So in dementia, it typically um, happens with apathy, where patients feel, like I mentioned before, not caring much, having not much interest for things that they used to do before, not caring much about this or that. There is some social disengagement, so they don't care about connecting with others anymore. Um, there is this irritability that is usually uh, reported by family members, so they get easily irritable. Um, within a short period of time, and that's uh, a change from before. And then more in more advanced stages of the condition, you know, we see a lot of agitation, we see aggression, we see wandering off, we see psychosis, and at this point, we can only treat this kind of symptoms, the presentation. There is no um, preventive measure anymore. It's really just toggling what we are actually um, faced with, and, and like I said, this will be more like in the middle and late course of a neurodegenerative condition where we see this the most. Next. So my general recommendations is really to keep the emotional symptoms under control as well as your chronic medical conditions. So if you suffer from hypertension, diabetes, carpal tunnel, 
uh, myocardial uh, type of pathology. Whatever it is that you are experiencing, having those conditions well treated with medication, you know, it's the key. Um, so if you maintain those conditions well controlled, then your cognition will most likely improve as well. So like I mentioned before, practicing a good sleep hygiene, having a full night of sleep, six to eight hours, it's what's recommended. Um, keeping a routine, it's very, it's very good and, or, and advisable. Organized information, you know, use a calendar, a day planner to organize, uh, and that way you will guide the brain in general. So uh, in my practice, I, I ask patients always to uh, use compensatory strategies and to try to, you know, um, organize the information uh, to help their memory, such as mnemonics, chunking, categorizing the information into categories, writing things down, uh, repeating things over and over again if you're learning new information. Obviously, uh, a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old brain is not the same as a 55-year-old brain or a 65-year-old brain. So now we need to utilize more strategies, you know, to actually make new learning happen because it's not going to happen, you know, as fast as it used to, like before. So we need to kind of help the brain uh, with different strategies and the, the more the merrier so that we can learn effectively the information. So making use of an agenda to keep track of scheduled appointments, important events, um, your payment due dates, your times for medications in general. So using also a medication sorter, if you're taking a lot of medications for multiple conditions, I highly recommend using one of those nice medication sorters so that you know that you took your medication or not. Because oftentimes we go through so much in life and we're doing so much on a general basis daily that it's, it, you can forget whether you took your blood pressure medication or not in the morning. And the only way for you to know is if you have that uh, a slot empty on your sorter, you know, then you would know that you took it. So prevent, you know, um, forgetting or, or dealing with that kind of forgetfulness. Um, you can use also at home a color coding system, you know, for maintaining doctor's appointments. We'll use this type of notebook for you can label materials, you can you can use you know your imagination to kind of help yourself to organize your information. I also um, recommend kind of putting the same um, items in the same spot always. For example, if you come home from from outside, putting the keys in the same place, putting your cell phone in the safe in the same place, um, even your glasses, your reading glasses on the same place, because we are going to tend to forget if we place it on different places every time then you're going to go crazy trying to look for your uh, reading glasses um, versus having it placed in the same you know a spot every time you will just go there immediately okay so that's a, a good tip to follow um, like i said you know make associations also uh, so the idea is to create as much you know strategies as possible to to learn information so association is a good one as well. Just like repetition is, we learn to relate new information to things that we already know. So come up with a story in your mind. Like let's say if you have to go to the supermarket, to the grocery store and get milk, eggs, bread, you know, because you're trying, you're making something, a dessert, you know, kind of, you know, create a story in your mind about I'm going to do this and that because I have, uh, these family members coming over and we're going to meet for dinner or create a story around it so that when you get to the grocery store, when you um, remember that person that is coming for dinner, you can immediately associate it to the specific items that you need to purchase. So that's a good way to also learn new information. So distractions uh, should be minimized while trying to complete any type of task. OK, um, avoid interference effects. Um, so if you're on the phone, but you also, you know, have the, the TV on and someone is talking to you. And so we have to avoid those type of distractions and try, try to do only one thing at a time. 
In new learning, involve your senses with all modalities, so visual, verbal, written, anything that can help you learn the information better. Also, teaching others. When we teach others, we process the information again in our brains, and just telling them the process, you know, uh, also involves, yeah, it's going to help with new learning, definitely. So for healthy aging, my general recommendations in general is obviously research has shown years after years that physical exercise is the only thing proven to increase the cells in your brain. Uh, following a healthy lifestyle that incorporates physical exercise, rest, healthy diet, um, social interactions, and then just a variety of activities that challenge you and that you like, that you enjoy doing. Um, the idea is to make you happy. So, uh, you know, it, you're going to segregate certain um, certain chemicals in your brain, cortisol, that it's going to help you process the information better if you are in a more positive mood than you're in a depressed mood. So the idea is for you to be happy. So in making you happy, if you need to go dancing, if you need to go meet other people and have some interaction in the community, going to church, whatever makes you happy is the key to having really a healthy brain in general. So like we mentioned before, uh, you know, it's, it's it relying on compensatory strategies really to help your memory is the key. Um, so but pace these activities uh, to manage your physical and cognitive fatigue. We don't want you to get overwhelmed in employing these uh, strategies to the point that then you're going to cause mental fatigue. So try to just, you know, maintain a feasible amount of activity um, that is adaptable to you, that works for you, and um, and it should be okay. Now, if you are working and um, it's too much to go in um, and deal with other people, you know, the, the environment in general, so try, you know, if your job allows it, try telecommunicating. You know, uh, nowadays it's very easily ac acceptable in, in employers, so it's up to you if you don't want that, you know, kind of uh, lot of people around you. But again, the social interaction is actually healthy for your brain. So that's like a double-sided uh, situation. So these are some of the uh, mental health apps that I have come across uh, that are actually good. Um, calm, Headspace, Breathe to Relax, uh, CBT Eye Coach, especially for insomnia, the Mindfulness app as well, Breathe, Calm Down, Meditate, Insight Timer, Mood Tools, Mood Kit, uh, Virtual Hope Box, and Take a Break. Obviously, the most important factor is actually to go seek professional help. So going to a clinical psychologist to address and verbalize your needs, your uh, concerns, it, it's advisable. This is someone that obviously has a license uh, in clinical psychology and will know best on how to guide your thoughts and your emotions so that you can process the information in a healthy manner um, and hopefully um, teach you effective learning and coping strategies in dealing with your immediate stressors or even chronic medical conditions. This person can also help you kind of adapt um, to lifestyle changes with those types of conditions as well. So I, I highly advise for everybody to undergo and to go into individual psychotherapy with a professional or rather than just employing these kind of apps. Next, I think we already went over this slide. This is a repeat. All right, and that's the end of my presentation. I, I hope that you learned something out of this uh, presentation this evening. And I welcome questions and further discussion. Good, here we go. Fatigue and cognitive issues are the two most important things for me and many people with multiple sclerosis, writes a person. Why are these not the primary endpoints for clinical trials of new medications? Yeah, so fatigue, that's a great question. So fatigue is a, it, it's a very common symptom. And, and you're right, especially in multiple sclerosis. 
And I believe so too. I think that it should be, uh, we should have more research studies to include these in general because it overlaps so much um, with what we're trying to do also from a cognitive remediation standpoint. If you're having fatigue, it's very difficult to concentrate and, and it's gonna be difficult to even employ the compensatory strategies that we talked about to aid your memory. So I believe so, but I don't know why they're not including more um, these kind of symptoms in their studies. Great, thank you for that. Before I ask you the next question, I forgot to say Happy New Year to everybody. So Happy New Year, all right? I'm glad you're all here. We have a lot of people online. It's very nice to see. It's our first program of this year. I'm not up jumping around because I said earlier, I have a broken leg. I've had this now since June, and that's another whole issue, but it's not cognitively, cog cognitively related. All right, next question. Why does my neurologist never measure my fatigue and cognition but is just interested in my walking and MRI lesion, lesions. So typically, you know, uh, these symptoms you don't see. It's what we call the invisible, you know, uh, symptoms of MS because we don't see uh, cognitive disturbance, you know, much, especially in the early stages. And, and it's, it's the ideal time to go to a neuropsychologist uh, because we know that memory agents, you know, have the greatest impact earlier on when patients present even with prodromal stages of mild cognitive impairment. Um, so you should definitely, you know, ask your neurologist uh, to send you uh, to for neuropsychological testing or even, you know, uh, an MRI of the brain using neuroquant analysis. So neuroquant analysis will actually take a look at the quantitative data and analyze it uh, of the specific structures that have to do with memory in the brain and learning. So it's very neat and it comes with percentages of the actual volumetric analysis that it does. And, and it's, it's great to have it there, especially if, like I said, if you are already having some issues with memory or cognition in general. So you should, if the neurologist is not sending you, um, you should definitely ask your neurologist to, to send you to a neuropsychologist. All right, great, thank you for that. Next one, can brain atrophy be accurately measured and how closely does this correlate with cognition and predict further cognitive decline? Yes, another great question. So atrophy can definitely be measured nowadays. So like I mentioned with MRI of the brain using neuroquant analysis, we can measure the atrophy in each structures of the brain that have to do or that relate to memory. The cingulate cortex, you know, the, the, the hippocampi, uh, the thalamus, and all the different structures of the brain will actually be depicted on this report and it will give you a nice volumetric analysis of each structure. So atrophy is definitely a risk factor for developing any type of dementia, especially Alzheimer's. So you would want to know if you were having atrophy earlier on. Thank you. Next one, Ritalin helps my fatigue and cognition. Is it safe to take this long term? Uh, people with ADHD take it for years. Why is it not prescribed more for people with MS? So when it comes to medications, you have to consult with your neurologist to see what's adequate for you, given, you know, what other medications you're taking and what other conditions you do have in general. Um, so it really depends, you know, of your functional abilities. So if you're at work or if you're in school and you do need medication to treat attention deficit disorder, then of course, you know, you need it. But if you're not in school, you're not at work, um, and you know, the less medications, the better, I, I think. But you should definitely consult with your neurologist if you're considering any of those medications, consult with a neurologist. Thank you. So next, we have, I'm gonna take some from online, Personally, a person writes, thank you so much for this talk. So thank you so much for this talk. All right, uh, next, uh, person writes, what are recommended activities like video games, word games, and et cetera, to help engage your brain? So for the most part, uh, what I recommend my patients is to engage in pleasurable activities. 
So any activity that is of your interest and that you enjoy doing anything, whether it'll be, you know, playing card games or whether it'll be going out dancing or going to the gym or people like some people like different kinds of activities or talking to other people, sitting down at a park and just, you know, uh, watching you know, the birds sing. So it's up to you. It's what you prefer. So the idea is for you to feel good about yourself and what you're doing and to make yourself happy because that will promote a better cognitive health in general, right? So I mentioned a few apps um, that are available, mobile apps that you can download and uh, you can do this mental games and, and whatnot. Uh, but I don't want you to also overwhelm yourself. Like I had... Uh, a patient at once come to me and saying, you know, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm freaking out because I can't really seem to do the 15 minutes that I have to do fast enough. So that's not the point of this kind of activities, because I, like I said, the point is to work at your pace. Uh, you know, it has to be pleasurable to you, whether it be knitting, whether it be sewing, whether it be painting by numbers, whether it be gardening, it's whatever activity you find pleasurable. That will make you feel happy. I don't want you to be overwhelmed. But in general, anything that will stimulate new learning. So learning a musical instrument, for example, learning to play the guitar, the piano, or, you know, taking, you know, uh, uh, French classes or, you know, learning a new language. So anything that it, it's new learning, engaging in new learning, it stimulates the brain and the parts of the brain that you would engage in learning so the frontal lobe and also temporal areas you know for memory uh, retrieval so new learning in general you know it's advisable especially you know through music it's great um but you know you can pick up uh, you know any kind of calculation books from the dollar tree store from you know any walmart you know they have you know a second grade third grade where you can do math you can do complete sentences you can do word puzzles you can do any type of mental activity that you feel will stimulate your brain is great but to uh, a certain degree you have to take frequent breaks you cannot overdo it because then you will also trigger fatigue so that's not the point okay all right so before i get into all the other questions my days, I'm totally overwhelmed every day of the week, Saturday, Sundays, Monday through Friday, et cetera, with the, with the amount of things that I've got going on. This is not a, a, a complaining session. The point is that I went on a trip last week. I was gone for nine days. I was on a very nice cruise. I was extremely relaxed. I got so relaxed, my brain couldn't think right. Every time I put my phone down in the cabin or anywhere else, I freaked out a few moments later because I couldn't find it. And my brain wouldn't react to what was going on. And it was like my brain just shut down while on this trip. What causes something like that? So usually when we're in a break, when we're in a vacation break, yes, we shut down. We Because we're just experiencing um, what comes to us physiologically. So we're in a very relaxed state, okay? So it depends on, so you did a great job. I mean, you put yourself in that relaxed state that you were supposed to, and that's fine. And you should definitely uh, take the time to enjoy that process in itself, okay? So whether what you experienced, you know, not remember when you put your phone, uh, whether that's significant or not, then you should have yourself checked, you know, when you, came back from your trip, you don't have your subject, you mention it to your primary care doctor or to your neurologist and see, you know, if that's something that is significant for you. How, like I mentioned before, you would, you know, usually just go to a neurology visit. Uh, maybe they'll have an MRI of the brain, see if there's atrophy or not. Um, or if not, then it was just emotionally mediated. Maybe you were in, just in such a relaxed state that you didn't care much about you know, anything around you, you were too gone that you didn't realize, you know, about these things. But if you want to have yourself checked, I mean, that could be something random that happened to you and had no clinical significance. But if you do want to find out if there was any pathology behind that, then have yourself checked. Thank you. 
All right, going on to the other things. Um, a person writes, I completed neurological exam with 6% lower score in visual spatial than peers, but overall deemed okay. How often should a MS patient repeat the eight hour test? So typically we recommend uh, repeating the test or retesting uh, when there is suspicion of a decline or even an improvement. Let's say you've been on medication or memory agents for some time and you want to know um, if the medication is having that impact that you were looking for or the neurologist was looking for. And, um, and you definitely want to, 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 to find out. Um, but, you know, like I said before, you have to go to your neurologist and you have to seek, uh, you know, the advice from your neurologist. Typically, I like to retest my patients a year um, after so that I can compare, you know, performance to that prior year, especially if I want, uh, if I want to document uh, change a progression of symptoms, whether it will be improvement or decline. So usually a year would be, um, it's great if you only show deficit in one area, you know, visual spatial, but not learning a memory or executive. I, I think that that's actually great. And I would retest you for sure after a year. So what would you do after this year or five years or 10 years of testing somebody from their initial baseline and you do see a shutdown, things have gone wrong. Um, person can't remember where they put their phone or their keys anymore, um, or whatever goes on on your test, and you see um, a 20% drop in where they were previously, what would you do about this? So obviously that shows some clinical significance. So there's there must be some underlying pathology, like. Uh, neuronal degeneration and uh, I, I would advise the patient obviously to get treated with a memory agent and other recommendations as well. Right, so I've heard from others that they've been on some of these memory drugs and they have very bad dreams, I mean nightmares, um, good, bad, whatever, but it, it, they have very um, detailed dreams. Why does that happen? Every patient is different. Um, it's not supposed to happen, uh, especially with the like, dreams. Um, so every patient is different. Uh, it depends on, on really on the, where the medication is metabolized. I know um, that in general, it causes like GI kind of symptoms, like, you know, some discomfort uh, in the GI. So like nausea initially, you know, in the first you know, a few weeks that your uh, body is trying to adapt to the medication, you know, you have some GI, some gastrointestinal type of symptoms, but uh, it's not supposed to trigger any kind of um, symptoms within your dreams or affect your, that, that, that sounds like it's a whole different other pathology. Okay, thank you. For everybody online, I've got three questions remaining. If you have a question, type it because it won't get answered if you don't write it in. Okay, next person, up, oh, see, bingo, there's another question. All right, um, so from people prior, a person writes, building a story around a grocery list won't help me at all. If it's not on my grocery list or on my phone notes, it doesn't get bought. Is there any kind of therapy specific to MS for cognitive and memory issues? Yes, so there is cognitive rehabilitation therapy, and this is given by a speech and language pathologist. So as part of their treatment plan, they can include on there exercises for your memory, for learning, for processing speed that can definitely remediate or help remediate your problems, okay, with new learning. However, if, like I said, you know, you have to have yourself checked because if this is part of a neurodegenerative condition, no matter what you do, especially after a certain age, you know, um, the brain doesn't have the same capacity to learn new information anymore. And um, so you're going to have to rely on compensatory strategies such as, you know, writing things down because we don't have the same ability that we had before of learning new information without help. So part of that is just writing a list so that you won't 
remember, you won't forget what you have to buy at the grocery store, unfortunately. Um, but at least, you know, there is that. You're able to write it down. Um, so, but, but yeah, you can get help um, from cognitive rehab therapy. That's correct. And for the person, right, that wrote that question, believe me, there are so many people that go through that, whether you have MS or not age related as well so um you know meet the challenge meet the challenges that are ahead um okay next person writes what can be done for brain atrophy so there is medication that treat memory loss especially neurodegenerative conditions so if brain atrophy is already showing on neuroimaging and we also find deficits consistent with that on neuropsych testing, there is treatment for it to slow it down. So you don't want to go untreated for years and years because it will definitely progress very fast and will essentially affect your quality of life. So getting help, you know, um, at the right stage in your condition is the best advisable recommendation that I can give you. Okay, thank you. So it will MS atrophy, will brain atrophy from the MS, can it cause dementia? Yes. Okay, thank you for that. All right, next one. We have, uh, what role does, shoot, sorry, not one moment. All of a sudden, a slew of questions are coming in. So it just bounced around here. What role does neurological test, does the neurological test have when applying for uh, disability through work? Yes. So at times when you're applying for disability, whether it be through the Social Security office or um, to obtain long term disability insurance through your job, oftentimes they do require you to go through neuropsychological testing, especially if you are reporting um, cognitive changes. So if you're reporting memory loss, if you're reporting changes in your attention and concentration or language deficits, um, anything related to your thinking abilities, they'll make you go through a neuropsychological <clears throat> evaluation so that we can assess using, uh, like I mentioned before, a standardized um, test to evaluate all of your cognitive functions. We also have ways to assess validity, so an effort and motivation. So if you were trying, let's say, to fake bad or fake good or present yourself in a better uh, light or worse, um, we also have measures to assess, you know, your effort and motivation, and sometimes employers want to see that. So, um, and also the court system for disability cases. Okay, thank you. So the next person writes, should a test be done for everyone that are diagnosed with MS or just certain people? The answer is yes. But again, I'm a neuropsychologist, and it depends on the practice of your neurologist. Um, luckily, and uh, I have been blessed to be to work along with neurologists that really appreciate, uh, you know, the whole inclusive, comprehensive aspect uh, of MS, and they include everything um, that you need in your in your medical care, including um, cognition. Because, like I mentioned before, it's a silent kind of symptom, and it's not seen physically. So it's very difficult to even address or even treat if the patient is not, you know, uh, its best advocate, and you don't voice it to your neurologist. Um, but again, I've been blessed to work with neurologists that really appreciate the holistic aspect of med of care for MS. So they usually, you know. Um, they're very pro-psychological and neuropsychological oriented, so they sent all patients to us for testing just because they want to obtain a baseline even from the very beginning of the diagnosis so that later on we can always compare, you know, um, profiles to how the patient uh, did before. But I have seen it's not unusual to see patients that have never gone through testing before and we don't have anything, any baseline at all. Um, and then they, they show significant deficits when we see them. So we just have the pre-morbid data to compare to. So how you were functioning before at work and um, how you did in school. So those are the factors that we consider when we're trying to establish a baseline for you. Thank you. So for those that are like seniors and they've never had cognitive testing and they've had MS for 
30 plus for 40 plus years. Do you suggest at that age that they even get tested? Yes. So if the neurologist doesn't know uh, what medications to use with that particular patient because they don't have the right classification of the degree of the deficits, whether they'll be, there is an ample range from normal to mild to moderate to severe. And they usually don't prescribe the same medication if you're presenting with moderate to severe symptoms that if you're presenting with mild symptoms especially given your other conditions as well. If you're presenting with a vascular type of dementia and not an Alzheimer's type of dementia, you require different treatment. And also given the degree and severity of your deficit. So it depends with your clinical presentation, what kind of symptoms you're presenting with. So if your initial symptom like we uh, went over before include hallucinations or it includes um, Parkinsonian type of symptoms that you never had before, tremors, or if it presents now with worsening fatigue and memory loss, you know, than any other type of symptoms. So that that's very telling in itself. So depending on the clinical scenario of each patient and how well you test on this cognitive test and compared to your neuroimaging and your other conditions, so they can lean towards one medication over the other one that could be more effective if we understand what I'm saying. Um, so we can't give you a medication if you're presenting with just mild to moderate versus moderate to severe. So we have to classify the degree of your severity in order to prescribe the right treatment. Okay. Person writes, my neurologist's office um, has extensive testing that they do in the office. How might that differ from what is done by a neuropsychologist? So usually um, if they have a neuropsychologist within the neurology practice, I think that they will do enough. Some neurologists also, if not most of them, uh, also do some cognitive testing, but it's very brief um, in their practice, like a mini mental status exam, for example, like an MMSC or a MOCA even an R bands that might do just to obtain an overall cognitive functioning ratio. But if you want a more in-depth, you know, um, assessment, you would have to go through a, a neuropsychologist. And it doesn't have to go, it doesn't have to be, you know, doing a full eight hour testing, you know, um, it could be, it could range anywhere from an hour and a half to three, four hours. It doesn't have to be eight hours of neuropsychological testing. Okay, thank you. Next one. Could having had COVID affect my cognition? I've had MS for over 20 years and never had the problems I've begun to have now since having COVID. Yes, absolutely. So at Memoria, we do have a post-COVID a post clinic and I've seen a lot of patients um, uh, whose cognition has been affected post-COVID. So it's definitely for sure um, something to look into and to get tested because most most likely, you know, if that was the clinical um, course, you know, if you never had the symptoms before and it presented after COVID, then yes, having yourself checked because most likely, just like we do have disturbances in our olfaction, our, we have headaches, we have, you know, other kind of milder symptoms, you may also have cognitive deficits. Like I said, it's difficult to address and treat because we don't see those symptoms, unless you're working, unless you're functional, and you're able to see that you're not able to learn as quickly as before, or think as quickly as you did before. So uh, you have to address those symptoms, you know, immediately. Okay, thank you. Next one writes, why do I often forget? Why do I often forget something that I was about to say when I'm interrupted by something or someone one minute in the head and the next it's gone. Why? So there could be multiple reasons why. So like I mentioned before, um, there's something called executive functioning in the brain. So it's our ability to actually plan, organize the information. It's almost like the director of an orchestra. And if we're not able to do that, and that sometimes has to do with our ability to discriminate. So we have to choose not to do two and three and four when we're doing one thing. Because if you choose to do multiple things at the same time, 
chances are that you won't complete any and you will forget the first one you were doing in the first place. So it's adapting to our age, you know, that we have to address this kind of issues and see if there is improvement after that. So avoiding interruptions uh, that will cause interference with new learning is the key. And then if after that you still experience the same kind of issues, then getting yourself checked is the best scenario so that you're able to see if there is an underlying pathology like neurodegeneration so that you're able to treat it effectively. Thank you. Next question and last question. How do spatial deficits affect people? So visual spatial deficits um, are, come from the right side of the brain for most people. And um, this will be our ability to navigate in the environment. So if you're driving, for example, um, following a GPS, you know, will require you to have some sort of visual spatial ability. Um, you know, it can affect your reaction as well, knowing whether you're going east or south or west and, and following intricately that GPS. So that's kind of like navigational type of perceptual 3D kind of information on the brain, and that's coming from the right side of the brain. So following maps, it's a great example. Um, just if you were to uh, replicate any type of figures, any type of visual spatial kind of information that you have in front of you, and then recall it later, you know, that would require visual spatial a skill. So if you're experiencing that, getting yourself checked is the best way um, to avoid further decline. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that was our last question. And I'm gonna thank you again for, for navigating past the technological issues that we had earlier. And I wanna thank everybody else for being online tonight as well. So thank you again, and everybody have a great night. Doctor, again, thank you. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you all.